It is a pleasure to be sharing another morning with you all. A couple of weeks ago when I realized that I was going to be speaking this Sunday morning, I looked at the reading and I almost chuckled for a few seconds because this idea of surrender has been a recurring theme in my own life experiences and uh, also those close to me and in my thoughts and meditations for at least two or three months now. So I'm not sure if I was having those experiences that I may share today or I'm sharing today because it has already been in my mind. Reality is not as linear as we think it is, so it doesn't quite matter. You know, three weeks ago, exactly to the date, a very dear friend of ours, her name is Uma, for those of you who are watching this from Palo Alto, uh, I'm sure all of you know her very well. She has been residing in our community in Paul, uh, Mountain View for many, many years, for decades. She has been quite ill for some time, and three weeks ago, I think uh, she needed some medical attention. I've been aware that she has been ill for at least four to six weeks, and I've been watching her, and I was also aware that she was fairly resistant to seeing the doctor or getting medical treatment. She was hoping that it was just going to pass away. But gradually, I was also uh, you know, made aware that it's not something that's going to be easy. You know, it is something perhaps that she needs a doctor for and she needs to get some treatment. So I was uh, a little hesitant to approach her because I knew her views on these things. It is not that healing prayers are not effective, but certain material realities have to be dealt with on the material plane. So I approached her one afternoon and I said, you know, I'm aware that you're not feeling well. And you do understand at some point, this, if this doesn't go away, we do have to do something about it. We have to see a doctor or go to a hospital or something. And uh, she was not very impressed with my suggestion. And our conversation was rather brief. But I had made my point, and I was not going to impose my will on anyone else. So our conversation ended, and I went back to my apartment. As it happened, later on that same evening, I again bumped into her. Somehow she had had a few hours to think about it and she came up to me herself and said, you know, I think uh, we need to go to the hospital. We need to find a doctor. I think I'm not feeling well. And I thought, yes, I'm aware. Uh, how about we talk tomorrow morning and we'll figure it out. We'll see what doctor or what hospital to seek help from. You know, I came back to my apartment. As I thought about it, I realized that's not what's trying to happen here. She needs attention right now, right this minute. And, you know, as most of my SOS calls go, I called Shanti and I asked her for her counsel. And after getting some sound medical advice, I went and met Uma. Uh, actually, I called another friend of mine, Joycey. Uh, most of you are watching this from Palo Alto know the people I'm talking about. And Joycey and I walked into Uma's room. This was 9 or 9.30 at night. And uh, she was not expecting us. She was watching something on her computer. And we you know, casually uh, walked into a room and we stood by her. You know, at that moment, I just intuitively knew I had been very strict with my quarantine guidelines, my six feet and my mask and all of that. But somehow I just felt intuitively I had to relax a little bit right now. Uh, so I went close to her so I could just physically stand next to her and hold her as we were talking. And uh, but even before I said anything, uh, Uma just looked at the two of us. I don't know what she was watching. She was watching some spiritual talk by a teacher. And she said, I know I need to surrender. And then there was this pause. And then she said, but it is so difficult. It is not easy. And we were just looking into each other's eyes for a few seconds. And um, I just said, I understand. There was nothing else I could say. It is not that I've lived through the experience that she's going through, but in that moment, I could just feel the intensity of her quest and just all the effort that she was putting forth to deal with the situation in her own life. And after that, you know, there was a little bit more of a conversation and, uh, you know, we went to the emergency room and uh, she has been medically very well cared for uh, since that incident. She's still fighting a lot of very serious physical illnesses. So if you are watching this and if you happen to know who I'm talking about, please do send a prayer. Now, yesterday, as I was thinking about this topic and this idea of surrender, I was reviewing a lot of different things written by Paramahansa Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda. The piece of literature that popped out to me the most is this poem, uh, which we perform as a ritual every Sunday. It is called the Festival of Light. Most of you are familiar with our Sunday services, if this is not your first time. 
I'm sure you're aware of what I'm talking about. It was this extremely inspired piece of scripture, literally, that came to Swami Kriyananda in the year 1986. And since then, across all Ananda centers in the world, we perform this as a ritual, as a ceremony here in Palo Alto and in the US. We perform this every Sunday. And this is this beautiful, uplifting piece of mystical poetry that is talking about the soul's journey, that is a reminder for us to tune into every single week to renew our vows of spirituality as we go about doing our things in this world. And uh, this poem is allegorical. It talks about the soul's journey, but in the story of a little bird. Uh, I don't know where that image came from or why Swami Kriyananda chose that, but he tells us the story of this little bird. This little bird leaves its parents' home. We are, it is a soul leaving God, and the parents send it out into the world, just as we have all been sent by God into creation to express ourselves, to share this joy of the divine that is present inside each one of us freely with everyone around us. But soon, after some time, the bird gets confused. The bird starts to think that it is all about I, me, myself, that all these things that are flowing through me, that are coming through me are in fact mine. It starts taking things personally. And uh, it moves on to its next stage, which Swamiji calls the revolt. And to quote directly from the festival, rain and wind lashed at its wings. The more it fought, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. These are, uh, this is how the festival goes, the poetry uh, of these lines. And uh, the tiny little bird hears to this advice from the wind, and it gives itself to the hands of the wind, and it finds itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. This story that Swami Kriyananda is talking about, this entire piece of mystical poetry, the scripture, the festival of flight, I realized as I was meditating yesterday, it is in fact the perfect essence of what we are discussing today, of this reading, of this idea of surrender, which has been recurring in my own life, but in essence it is kind of the summary or the end goal of all of our spiritual seeking and all the philosophy and all that we study to ultimately gather up our own will but to surrender, but to let go at the feet of the divine. The bird is struggling, just as we struggle in the world when things don't go our way. Constantly we are facing one obstacle after another, and the wind is telling, give yourself into my hands, get in tune, be in tune with what's trying to happen. You know, the karma and dharma of life, whatever it is that you've come with, that is your own key to salvation. The more you can live in alignment with that, the more you will be able to soar joyously high above the clouds. You don't need to struggle this way if you would just live in the way that you were meant to live, in tune with your own calling, in tune with whatever it is that is trying to express through this incarnation. So the bird does soar, and it goes on well for a while, it is still daytime. But the story is not over yet, because soon night falls, and the bird starts to wonder. It has been soaring all this while, high above the clouds, but now it starts to wonder, how can I fly in this darkness? Because all this time, as much as the bird was doing its own duty in the world and it was being carried by the power of the uh, wind behind its wings, it was soaring, but it was still able to see, it was still able to control, it was still able to navigate through all of that uh, to whatever it was in front of this tiny little bird. We are talking about our own souls here. But suddenly we reach a stage when night falls we reach crises, we reach challenges, there are changes that we cannot cope with. All of us have been through this experience, and even if you have not, all of us do go through this experience because one day or another, you know, we are going to be at a point where we are going to face that unknown when we have to ultimately leave this body. But we don't even have to wait till then. We all know what crisis feels like. We all know when uh, it feels like there's a huge catastrophe happening in our life. Somehow things are falling apart. We don't know what to do about it. And during those times, it becomes even more difficult. All this effort that we put forth to hold this together somehow is not as effective. It's not as easy to be in alignment with the divine will somehow when these changes are challenging us from outside. 
you know, a few months ago, uh, probably a couple of months ago, I was discussing this topic of surrender with a very dear friend. friend. We were going for a walk, and he was sharing some stories with me, stories from lives of saints uh, on this theme, and he was going through certain situations in his own life. And I was reminded of a song. As most of you know, I had some training in Indian classical music growing up, and this was a bhajan. A bhajan is a piece of devotional poetry that I had learned many, many years ago. I did not even remember how the tune went, but I somehow remembered the words because they were very powerful. It was written by a very famous medieval saint hundreds of years ago who was a mystic. And uh, for those of you who are wondering if you're Indian, the starting line of this poem, poem is Suneri Mene Nirbal Ke Balaram. The literal translation is, I've heard that for the meek and those without any power of their own, God is the ultimate source of power. And I was talking with my friend and I told him I'm reminded of this song because whatever you're telling me right now is so much of what I remember feeling when I heard this song many years ago and I went back and I uh, you know, learned the song again and I recorded it also for my friend. Uh, in this song, the poet, poet goes through uh, in each stanza stories from Indian mythology and scriptures and all of that. And uh, in each stanza, he tells the story of somebody who was courageous enough to surrender and in whose life God's grace des descended. I'll just share one of them with you right now. Uh, it is a story of uh, a queen named Draupadi from the epic of Mahabharata. Uh, if you're familiar with the story, if you've been studying the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, you're probably aware at least a little bit of the story of the Mahabharata. Even if you're not, it doesn't matter. In essence, in short, the story of Mahabharata is this allegorical story of two warring clans of cousins. It's also a real event that happened. It's not just allegorical. But the way it's written and the way Yoganandaji interpreted it for us, he explained how every character in that story is in fact a symbol for an aspect of our own consciousness, for mental citizens that reside within us. And uh, the story is about two cousins, two clans of cousins who fight this huge battle. The evil guys are called the Kauravas and the good guys are called the Pandavas and this battle is happening inside us. Now the story I'm going to share is well before the battle, it's called the Game of Dice. And uh, both the cousins at one point in the story, they are ruling different parts of the kingdom and they are you know, seemingly living in harmony, although not, because the evil guys are eyeing on the assets of the good guys. So Duryodhana, who's the head Karava brother, who's the head of all the bad people, he invites the Pandava brothers to this game of dice. And uh, it's a gambling match. And because of their own delusions, the Pandava brothers also fall into this trap, and they start playing this game of dice in the court of the Kauravas. In short, fast forwarding the story, the dice, the game itself is loaded in favor of the Kaurava brothers. So there was no chance that the Pandavas had of winning anything at all in this game. They were bound to lose everything that they were going to bet on. And gradually they started losing one thing after another. They lost their kingdom, they lost their crown, they lost all their wealth. And it reaches a point where they lose themselves because Duryodhana says, you know, what do you have left? You can yourself become slaves. You know, you can bet on yourself, each of you as the Fry brothers. And, um, you know, if you win, you can have everything back. And if you lose, you become my slaves. And in that way, the five brothers also become his slaves. And at this point, the story reaches a really, really low point. Duryodhana says, oh, all of you are already slaves of mine, but you still have something. You're still married to the Queen Draupadi. How about you bet on her? If you win, you can have everything back, and if you don't, she also becomes my slave. And you know, the Pandavas have no option. They want every single ray of hope to get something back, so they bet on Draupadi as well. And as you would guess, they lose Draupadi as well in that game. And at this point, Duryodhana is elated. There is nothing left to be taken from the Pandava brothers. And he demands, he sends a messenger to the court of Draup to Draupadi's quarters, asking her to show up because now she is a slave of Duryodhana. And this messenger goes. Now, Draupadi, for those of you who don't know, is one of the most powerful figures in the entire Indian mythology. She is the most powerful female figure. And she just expresses this intensity and passion. The story I'm sharing is not necessarily about 
the symbols and the allegory, but she's allegorically representing the Kundalini energy, so she can, uh, you can see what kind of a personality she has. And as soon as the messenger goes into Draupadi's quarter, she's just completely you know, surprised. Who are you? I'm the queen, I'm an empress. How dare you order me? I'm not gonna show up anywhere because somebody is asking me to, and she sends the messenger back. And Duryodhana now sends his own brother Dushasana. Duryodhana, if you're curious, is a symbol for material desires, and Dushasana is a symbol for anger. Now, Dushasana goes to Draupadi's quarters, you know, asking her, demanding that she come with him to the court because her boss, Duryodhana, is asking her to. And Draupadi does not relent. He, she's like, you know, what's wrong with you? How could you say such things to me? I'm your queen. And Dush Dushasana does not take no for an answer. He grabs Draupadi by her hair and drags her, starts dragging her from the queen's quarters into the court where this game of dice is happening. You know, if you've seen this scene dramatized in movies or TV series, it's just so stunning to even watch because you're not expecting this. And Draupadi is brought into this court and she's still completely enraged at what's happening. You know, she threatens everybody in the court. She said, I'll curse all of you. What's happening here? All of you are watching this are just puppets looking at this kind of a completely dishonorable behavior being displayed in front of your eyes. And she demands justice in this court. But everyone is powerless. Nobody is able to do anything to save Draupadi. And this goes on, and Duryodhana is just having the day of his life. And he demands, he uh, commands Dushasana, saying, you know, this lady is just talking too much. I want to take away all her pride. I want to take away her honor in front of everyone. So I want you to disrobe her in front of everybody gathered in this court. I want you to pull her sari away from her. So Dushasana walks by, and she, he starts pulling on Draupadi sari. And at this point, Draupadi has a realization. She realizes that she has reached the limit of all that she could hold on to with her own individual will. She has tried her best, she fought the battle, and she realizes there's nobody that can save her at this moment than Krishna. Draupadi is a great, great devotee of Krishna uh, who is constantly in communion with him. And then she surrenders. And as soon as she does, even as the story is told, as soon as Draupadi, Draupadi gives up, as soon as she decides that there is nothing left for her to do, even before she finished saying the name of Krishna, he was already there. The court was filled with light. And you know the story gets interesting from there. The Shasana keeps pulling on her sari. And as it happens, you know this sari that Draupadi is wearing, it just looks like a piece of cloth. But it's unending. It's inexhaustible. He pulls and pulls and pulls. And there's piles and piles of fabric accumulating in front of him. And finally, he gets tired and passes out. And at that point, the complete game of dice and everything that was happening there ends. Now, you have to read the story if you want to know what happens after that, but I'll move on. But I was thinking about that story because I have studied, discussed, and shared the allegorical meaning of all that's happening in this scene, but it never occurred to me until I noticed the words of this poem, this bhajan that I was learning, where this poet was saying, you know, as long as Draupadi had even one ounce of that egoic will left to keep fighting, to keep trying to control the situation, to make something happen, it is not that Krishna was waiting for her to give up. It's just that he just couldn't help, that grace couldn't come. But right at that moment when she said, God, I cannot do anything here. I'm not capable of solving this myself. Just at that moment when she reached that point of surrender, she opened the floodgates of grace and then she didn't even have to invite Krishna. He was already there waiting for her. So many times in our lives, we spend all this effort trying to control every inch, every minute detail of our life. We are so accustomed to it. In fact, uh, you know, this whole idea of trying to surrender is almost ironical because I can sit here and talk about, stand here and talk about, you know, 
how God is the only source of security, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything will follow. But at the same time, I'll be lying if I didn't say that there was a part of me that was seeking some kind of security in something material. If my own tiny little bag of wealth was running dry, there's some part of me there's, that's just gripped in fear. All these things that I find in this world to feel secure about and not just material things, even things of this body, this physical body that we are attached to, this mind that we treasure so much, all of this are our own ways of defining this tiny little universe so I can be in charge. I can make my life a little more comfortable. I think of so many of my friends, I used to work in the Silicon Valley with tech companies and uh, you know, you would see people so stressed, you know, commuting two hours every day, you know, working so hard and they would have families or wives or children that they need to, to care for. But I would wonder, but you are fairly wealthy, why do you have to take on so much stress? And it's not a question that you can openly discuss with everyone, but I've discussed with a few people and the answers are always very predictable, you know, if I just could save this much, this amount, so that I can retire, so I would feel secure, so I can do this, then my children can go to college, or whatever that is. We are constantly trying to make sure, you know, when night falls, when we feel afraid to fly in the darkness, somehow all of this is going to help us. Somehow we can set the stage right before night falls. But you see, we all know also from experience it doesn't work that way. I remember, uh, you know, growing up, as I was saying, I had some training in Indian music and um, in, throughout middle school and high school, I used to sing on stage a lot. I used to have opportunities to perform. But ironically, also, I just had a lot of uh, health conditions, not serious issues, but I was always having sinus infections or tonsil infections, or I would have mild asthma and things like that. So I would never know, even though I'm scheduled to perform or I'm supposed to be on stage on this particular day or time, I would never know until it actually happened that I would be able to, because I could just have an allergy that morning that would just, I would be perfectly fine. It's just that I wouldn't have a singing voice. So I cannot be on stage or do what I'm meant to do. And uh, I met an astrologer very early on. I didn't meet, you know, I just happened to, it. he was a friend of our family and he was reading my chart and he said, you know, we ha you have a lot of auspicious placements of planets in your chart. You know, you have a lot of divine mother's grace. You know, she's present in your life as artistic talent because of your own past karma. That's why you're able to sing and do all of this in this life. And I was a child, I didn't know anything at that point. And I thought, oh wow, I did not know that. <laughs> Here I thought I was singing, I was training so hard and I was doing all of this to perform. I did not know that divine mother was being with me and she was singing through me, that she was flowing through me. It is because of her presence that I'm able to do this. And because of those tricky health situations that I was always battling, it became even more vivid in my own life. Whenever I was able to sing, whenever I did in fact perform on stage, I was so happy, I was grateful because, wow, you chose to sing through me today, you chose to flow through me today, you didn't have to. And tomorrow, you know, I'm not a professional musician, and if tomorrow I lost my singing voice or you know, the world just did not hear me sing any time after today, it's not a big loss for anyone, it'll be quite fine. But there are other things that would be a lot more difficult for me to let go. You know, all the things that I was saying that we hold on to, that we cherish so dearly, that we are attached to, it's not easy, as my dear friend Uma was saying. I know I have to surrender, but it's not easy, it's difficult. And we go through that over and over again. And all of this confusion starts because, like that little bird, we get confused. We look at that package of gift coming from Divine Mother. She's just showering us with gifts every day. Every morning I wake up and there's some gift. You know, this body that's able to walk and talk. You know, this mind that is able to think clearly. Whatever, you know, food I have on the table that is you know, that I've been grateful to have, and all the other things, the relationships, the material things, all the comforts and luxuries I have in my life, these are all gifts that she's showering on me. And I open this box. We are so eager to play with the toy, we forget to read what's written on top of the box. It's not a gift, it's a loan. We have been loaned all these things, and Divine Mother is so generous and gracious with us that she keeps loaning all these things, but we get confused. We think it is ours. It is for ours to keep. The only thing that she's completely gifting to us unconditionally is her love. 
and we move through life and we get attached to this body, to this mind, one day it is not going to be ours. The singing voice is not going to be mine. The paltry wealth that's in my bank account is not going to be mine. The relationships will not be mine. And all that will be left is that choice that I can still make to surrender. Uh, and when we see it in that way, surrender, which almost sounds like we are making some big sacrifice, it is not a sacrifice. It is simply this place of knowing that everything that I'm doing, the way I see what I see, the energy that's flowing through me, the legs that are walking, the mouth that is speaking, the voice that is singing, and all the material things I own, these are all gifts. These have all come to me through the grace of the divine. And the more I can live in that state when night falls, you know, so that I can complete that sentence from the festival, the night whispers, it's Divine Mother whispering to all of us all the time, surrender to me and your strength will be renewed. And at that point, the bird starts to get it. And as soon as the bird sees it, Swamiji puts in this piece of poetry, you know, rain and grassy fields and all of creation begins to sing, behold, your strength to fly has never been your own. You know, and here we were thinking, this is all me, this is all mine to do, to keep. But it was never yours. It was just our confusion to start with. And when we can live more in that realization, like I was saying, it is so easy to say that I can give everything to God, that God, I surrender to you, I don't need this material wealth. But at the same time, we also have all these tendencies, all that's holding us back that we need to work through. So there is no way to move, to make progress on the spiritual path until uh, on some deep level we can acknowledge that this is all about surrender. This is all about seeing God flowing through us. It is all about giving it back to God when we can live in that flow, live in attunement with God's will. So God bless you.